dial in. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our JDRF Center of Excellence in Northern California call. We're very pleased that you have set aside some time to join us this afternoon. We have a great discussion planned. And before we get started, I'm just going to provide a few housekeeping tips for today's call. Everyone has been placed on mute upon entry into the call. For those of you who are unfamiliar, you can unmute yourself on the bottom left hand of your Zoom screen by clicking that microphone. But please do leave yourself muted unless you are asking a question at the end. That will help us keep the background noise to a minimum. In the bottom center of your screen, there is a chat function. It looks like a little dialogue box and you may place your questions or comments in that chat box at any time, although we will probably address most of them at the end. Finally, if you would like to change the screen view that you are looking at, you can go to the top right of your screen and hover over the icon that says view options and that will help you swap your shared screen with video if you'd like to do that. Next slide please. We also are going to take a brief opportunity to extend very warm thanks to Fiduciary Trust International for sponsoring today's event. Fiduciary Trust is the wealth management arm of Franklin Templeton Investments and Franklin and the Johnson family have been generous supporters of JDRF for about 20 years and we could not be more grateful for their ongoing and very generous support. Now, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our three guest presenters today. Aaron Kowalski, our president and CEO. Aaron has a bachelor's degree in biology and a PhD in molecular genetics from Rutgers. He's been with JDRF for over 15 years. And last year, Aaron transitioned from the head of research to becoming the first president of JDRF with T1D. Dr. Matthias Hebrock is the co-director for the JDRF Center of Excellence in Northern California. Dr. Hebrock has made seminal contributions to our understanding of the development of the pancreas and its insulin producing beta cells. And Dr. Sung Kim is also is the other co-director of this Center of Excellence. His research aims to enhance our understanding of mechanisms that regulate normal development of insulin producing cells and other islet cells. So I'm going to turn it over now to Aaron. Thanks, Elizabeth. And hi, everybody. It's great to see everybody on Zoom, although I wish we were together in Northern California. Uh, San Francisco being one of my favorite cities to visit in general, and of course the JDRF connection there with Stanford and UCSF and so much amazing research companies. Uh, the history there is, is, is unbelievable. Uh, I'll also extend my thanks to, to Franklin and Fiduciary Trust and the Johnson family I've been fortunate to know. 
uh, the Johnsons uh, for many years now, and they've been tremendous uh, T1D champions. And this is an opportunity uh, that they're providing us to really talk about some of uh, the science that I'm uh, most excited about. Um, I know everybody uh, is, uh, we're on Zoom and, it, and it's hard. These are uh, difficult times uh, in the face of COVID. I'm here in New Jersey uh, after fleeing uh, New York City in the beginning of March with my daughter back to our home uh, with my wife and two boys. And uh, th these are challenging times. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about something that isn't COVID uh, and is some of the most, uh, as I said, the, some of the most exciting science with two incredible investigators and their teams. I see a number of the team members on the screen, we'll, uh, we'll get to them in a little bit. Um, and talk about the center of excellence. Um, you know, JDRF, we're going through uh, some challenging times here as all not-for-profits and businesses are. And I think uh, this opportunity to highlight what is a top priority of ours, cures uh, for T1D and accelerating some of our most promising uh, science. And that's what uh, this center of excellence and the concept of centers of excellence is all about, acceleration. How can we drive more resources and uh, uh, free up uh, the researchers uh, who you'll hear from today to um, make significant adv advances faster? And that takes money, that takes time, uh, there are a variety of things that uh, we worked into this concept that I think will allow us um, to, to move faster. And I think that's what we all want to see here. Uh, we're talking about big bets. That's one thing. I know we have a former chair on the board, Mark Fisher Colbury, on the call. We have a number of our research committee uh, members on the call. A number of our scientists here advise us and one of the things that we hear quite often is we need to make big bets. We need to push on some of the most uh, promising science. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about flexibility in terms of these awards. Uh, I think there's a, a, a degree of flexibility and reduced administrative burden uh, that will uh, allow for acceleration as well. Um, so if you go forward one more slide, please. Uh, this is really uh, uh, just getting into a little more detail and I'll talk uh, some contextualization of this center, uh, Northern California with Stanford and UCSF to the premier institutions in the world, uh, uniting on a, 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 a cause that's all near and dear to us. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is take these promising uh, projects, uh, again, kind of turbocharge them, but in a coordinated uh, way. Uh, we're not bypassing our grant uh, review process. Our research committee is still very involved. There was a lot of, in, in this case, and each of the other centers, which I'll, again, uh, describe uh, um, a little bit uh, in more detail as well, so you can understand the kind of framing, is, uh, how do we, we leverage skill sets? How do we free folks up? Um, the, uh, how do we create, uh, and uh, some of you uh, have heard me say this word, this can maybe a uh, cooperation a little bit here. There'll be some, um, a, a lot of collaboration, but there's, there, there, there's certainly overlap in some of the work we're, we're supporting here. The, um, you'll, you'll get much more in terms of Stanford and UCSF in a second. Uh, we have funded uh, another uh, center at the University of Michigan. Uh, a key component of each of these that you'll hear is leverage. And we're leveraging tremendous resources at Stanford and UCSF, both uh, NIH funded uh, diabetes um, institutes, uh, significant other funding within the diabetes programs and other programs such as autoimmunity, uh, et cetera. Similarly, at Michigan, uh, we're piggybacking on NIH funding and uh, a significant effort 
uh, led uh, uh, by a volunteer at the University of Michigan who straddles the University of Michigan and JDRF, who's launching a major um, uh, diabetes center within the University of Michigan called M Diabetes. The center there uh, will be a little bit different than UCSF and Stanford. It's focused more on the metabolic, what our head of research, Sanjoy Duda, would call the metabolic milieu of diabetes complications and really, uh, and beta cells uh, in a person with diabetes. So there's a component of uh, stem cell biology there. There's a component of uh, diabetic kidney and eye disease and really looking at metabolism beyond uh, glucose in, in the context of type one. The other center that is in kind of a quiet phase, but we are uh, committed to, to funding is at Harvard, uh, a connection to both of our lead investigators here, Dr. Doug Melton, uh, uh, will be focused on gene editing of um, stem cells uh, and stem cell derived islets. Um, so the, the other thing that I'll, I'll say here is when we look at kind of my, where, where I'm most excited for, <laughs> for whatever that's worth, I think, uh, you know, being in this field a long time, but what, what, uh, what really gets me jazzed here is when I think of my fondness for, uh, for the work that's gone on at Stanford with, uh, 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 with Matthias, all due respect at, at UCSF, of course, I'm super fond of your work as well, but my history at JDRF goes way back to uh, uh, working with Bruce Buckingham and Daryl Wilson on artificial pancreas uh, projects. And, um, you know, the progress we've made there has been amazing. But the, the, the joke that I often make, and many of you have heard me say, is uh, nobody uh, who, who lives without diabetes have we ever seen uh, wearing an insulin pump. And the reason I make that point is uh, the, the goal for JDRF is cures for T1D. And what this UCSF Stanford partnership is driving towards is taking our pumps off and replacing uh, insulin production from a pump or even a smart pump with what nature intended, which is, which is with beta cells and islets. And we think back to uh, the promise here with the Edmonton protocol, uh, curing of uh, people with diabetes through islet transplantation, uh, we know it can be done. And some of you may debate uh, if that's a true cure, but uh, we, we have a number of folks in the Bay Area who've received islet transplantations. And uh, in one of my last visits with Matthias and, and Sung in downtown San Francisco, we had uh, one of our volunteers there who was off insulin because of an islet transplant. Uh, and if you talk to, to folks like that, they will tell you they're cured. Our challenge has been we, 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 we need a uh, solution that's, that's broader, that, that uh, can be scalable in a way that islet transplantation is not from a cadaver-based uh, uh, methodology, as well as the, the reduction in the need for chronic immunosuppression. And when I think of this center of excellence, um, that's where we're headed. Uh, and you'll hear from our investigators in a second. Um, if you go forward, I think we have a slide here um, with, with the team. When we talk about kind of the dream team of scientists, uh, and I'm looking at the, the, you know, the Stanford and UCSF folks on the screen, and if you can click on your videos, you'll see a number of these folks uh, in the room, so to speak. Uh, th th this, is, this, this problem is complicated. And this is another component of this center of excellence in, and even more broadly in the JDRF strategy is how do we get the right people in the room and collaborating and driving towards these solutions that break down some of these big barriers, such as uh, 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 rejection of, of foreign stem cell derived islets or vascularization or uh, re-educating the immune system like you'll hear about today. Um, the, we're, we're talking about immunologists, stem cell biologists, uh, gene editing, organ transplanters, uh, uh, surgeons, uh, molecular biologists, some of the smartest people uh, you'll meet, um, all working together towards a common um, uh, uh, solution. Um, you know, we, we have Sung and, and Dr. Hebrock, uh, Dr. Kim and Dr. Hebrock, 
uh, two just unbelievable researchers uh, who bring uh, genius, uh, passion, uh, knowledge of the field, uh, and are bringing a together this team uh, that will uh, drive this science. Um, and I don't want to steal uh, the, the, the thunder here, so I'm going to not go too far. Um, I'm just going to very quick, quickly before you get tired of me uh, speaking, just uh, mechanistically, why is this mechanism important as well? And one of the things that you'll hear, and I'm sure if you've talked about, oh, so I'm sorry, I jumped over uh, the, the center of excellence focus and we'll, we'll, we'll cover that. If you, you can go forward, Elizabeth, um, is uh, the mechanistically, what we're trying to do is also ease the burden on our researchers. You know, one of the challenges and the frustration that we hear when we talk to scientists and Matthias uh, was on a, a, an amazing panel of advisors to JDRF who, who talked to me and the research team about this, is uh, we have these incredible uh, scientists who are spending too much time writing grants. And this is another part of the center of excellence that I think is important, is this funding, it's a five-year commitment. There will be, of course, evaluation and the JDRF team is working with the teams at Stanford and UCSF in terms of oversight and collaboration, but there's less in terms of burden of rewriting grants over and over, uh, uh, the, the different progress reports and things that we're doing. Um, and I think the, the goal there is to uh, have the scientists working on the science free them up uh, and of course check in, but without undue burden. Uh, again, I talked about the focus here uh, in terms of the Northern California Center. You're gonna hear from the experts in a second. Uh, if you go uh, one more here, um, Elizabeth, um, you know, we kicked this off uh, not too long ago. It's, it's one of these things with all of us being uh, holed up in our homes that it feels like yesterday and it feels like years ago in some, in some res regards. Uh, but I, I, I will tell you that our team, the teams on the phone have not, uh, the, zero passion is, is uh, lacking to, to keep pushing forward. And I think this is why we're calling on volunteers like the folks on the phone um, to lean in uh, and be more supportive than ever of JDRF in, in a difficult time because this research is so important. So um, I am going to uh, uh, now pass the baton to uh, our experts in terms of, we have the, the doctors, Kim and uh, uh, Hebrock on the phone. Um, so we can have a discussion with all of you. Uh, and maybe uh, Matthias and Sung, we can just start out by uh, you know, introing yourselves and talking about why you're so excited about this project. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Aaron. This was great. And thank for all of you guys for making time today and, and joining us for the Zoom call. It's been, uh, it's been interesting six weeks, certainly. I'm sitting here in my home as well. I would love to be in the lab right now. We're doing things in the lab that we can do, but it is restricted. So thank you very much for, for helping us here and uh, listening to what we're trying to do. So I'm Matthias Abrock. I'm the director of the Diabetes Center at the University of California, San Francisco. I have spent almost 20 years now, a little bit over 20 years actually, at, at the university. I trained, as Aaron already said, together with Song actually, uh, a number of years ago with Doug Melton at Harvard, and I got my PhD at the Max Planck Institute before that. So what, what we have been doing in, in my laboratory, as well as in the Diabetes Center at UCSF is, is very simple. We have been trying to strip everything away from the disease of type one diabetes and have tried to understand what are the critical components that we really need to understand and then modulate to ensure that we understand the disease and that we can come up with a cure. And if you take everything away, there, there are two things that are standing. The one is the beta cell. Of course, that is the target of the immune system that goes in and unfortunately identifies our own beta cells as cells that do not belong to us. That's what we call an autoimmune disease. And then the immune system destroys the beta cells. 
So that's the second component. It's the immune system. And it's this interplay between the beta cell and the immune system that we think is absolutely essential for us to understand and then modulate so that we can come up with cures. Because even if we can, as we can today, do an islet transplantation, and said it, we don't have enough islets, so we have to make more beta cells. This is the supply side. But even if you make these beta cells, as we can now do in my lab and as well as around the country, a few other labs and companies who can do this, even if you make these beta cells and they are fully functional, if you put them back into the situation of an autoimmune disease in a, a patient with type 1 diabetes, the immune system will immediately recognize these beta cells and will take them out. So therefore, we have these two components and the two investigators on the beta cell side and on the immunology side that work together hand in hand, trying to understand and go back and forth how we can generate beta cells that are being protected, that are not being recognized by the immune system, and how we can use this information to generate cells that would can, or can go into patients to help regulate their glucose levels. The last component before I have handed over to Song, uh, the last component of what we have here, especially in the Bay Area, of course, is technology. And so not only do we have biologists who work on the beta cells and the immunology, and we are pretty good at what we're doing, we also have in our team put together people who are really driving the technology forward. And those have to do with not just gene editing, I'm pretty sure many of you have heard the term, the term CRISPR editing, which now allows us to go into any kind of cell. And out of 3 billion base pairs that exist, that's 10 times the population that we have in the United States, we can just take out one and modify this. And that gives us an amount of control to modulate specific gene expression or modify the expression of certain factors that we think will be critical in, in us helping patients with type 1 diabetes. So the combination of the biology, the beta cell that is the target, the immune system that is the destroyer, as well as the technologies that we are bringing to bear to really understand and then modulate our systems, I think we're gonna make a real difference in the lives of patients. That's great, Matthias, thank you. And you're really sporting the uh, COVID beard well. You look very stately. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry about that. I, I decided that this is something I should do. Um, just feels like this is the time to have a beard. Yeah, I wish I could. My problem is it doesn't grow in all the way, but uh, you look good. I'll pass the baton over to Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim is the uh, co-lead investigator from Stanford University, uh, also has received a number of JDRF grants, is renowned in the field. And Dr. Kim, we'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks, Matthias, for uh, talking about the framework of this in terms of the science and the goals. Um, I think there's a number of exciting aspects of this that I wanted to communicate to you uh, again today. Uh, one is that uh, it, it, the main thing is working with this group of people. Uh, we have, as you've seen in this slide that flashed by, uh, a great group uh, from two institutions, many on the call, from Stanford, Kyle Lowe and Everett Meyer are on the call and they can, uh, uh, they can chime in uh, at some point if they, uh, if they like. In addition to Matthias, I think Mark Anderson and Alex Marson, Julie Snedden, Audrey Parant, and perhaps I thought I saw Jimmy Chen there, uh, and uh, Kieran Kachalakota from Stanford. Jimmy and Kieran are the co-managers of this program. So there are two institutions separated by about uh, 20 some miles. And uh, we are, we, it's the center is about the people. It's not about the bricks and mortar. We're leveraging what institutional resources there are to diabetes centers that are established and supporting the research by the people, not buildings or, or things like that. So it's very responsive to uh, research uh, reality. Uh, the funding level and the duration is uh, realistic and understands the way research works, which is 
uh, as you're living through uh, contingent on the realities and needs to be nimble as well as uh, ferociously hypothesis driven. That's what we are. Uh, so that we're excited and grateful for the support of uh, and, and the vote of confidence in our ability, the people in this center to do this. Uh, the, the, the point of the center is to accelerate cures and we are really focused on that. The experiments that we're doing now are largely preclinical still, but they very much have a link to uh, a very clear trajectory toward doing clinical trials. I think the, the main outcome of this uh, kind of uh, center is at the end of uh, a certain period of funding to say, we are now poised because of the preclinical data that we've accumulated to run clinical trials. So that, is, that should be a clear message to you as well. We are not doing this to buffer our academic reputations or publish more papers. We want to run clinical trials. And uh, from my perspective, we are uh, not only close, we are actually doing clinical trials uh, in the background that are related. Uh, the projects that we are really focused on for, uh, are I I at UCSF and Stanford related to the immune system and its interaction with the, the cells that we're trying to replace, the beta cells. Uh, and uh, there are people here who at Stanford have already engaged in doing clinical trials. They are already doing them through other types of mechanisms, CIRM and NIH and other, uh, other entities that are related to immunotolerance uh, and immunosuppression, uh, but in a way that is uh, drastically different from the way it's been done. And that's why we're hopeful that what we're doing now a combination of ongoing clinical trials as well as preclinical work that will focus on making it safe and effective to replace islets and at the same time uh, modulate the autoimmune attack so that the islets are not uh, harmed after they're uh, replaced. Uh, that's the main focus of um, both of the understanding the immune system interaction to the islets and the first project that is in the center as well as using stem cell based approaches from blood stem cells combined with islet uh, replacement in the second project. And so uh, we are really, really, I think, focused on developing. And this is, I think, something that uh, has resonated with people I've spoken to in the past. We have a plan to go forward and uh, in, I think, a reasonable amount of time aspire to cure diabetes. So that's what I would end with uh, at this point, because I know that there are talking points and possibly questions that people might have around that. Um, okay. That's exciting, Song. Thank you. Um, just before we get into specific questions, I see there's already one up in the box here. You know, we, I, I use the, the term cooperation. Uh, we have two premier institutions, Stanford and UCSF here. Two uh, competitive investigators, Dr. Kim, Dr. Hebrack, talk a little bit about your history because I think uh, we, we in science, we see collaboration and competition kind of go hand in hand in, in accelerating research. You, you both have a bit of history together and I, I bet the folks would like to hear that uh, with a little detail. Uh, I joined the Melton Lab in uh, 1996 and uh, a few months later, Hebrock uh, joined. Uh, when when uh, he joined, I had just gotten married. And so we had a lot of things that we didn't need because two households merging, uh, there's excess. And so when he came with two suitcases and not a frying pan to his name, we gave him all of our junk. And in subsequent uh, iterations of that uh, rite of passage, everyone in the Melton Lab who came subsequently inherited some of that junk, including fans, heaters, pot, pots and pans. So we go, we go back uh, a long time. So 25 years, Matthias uh, met and accorded and subsequently married uh, his wife, uh, Sharon, and he happened to ask me to be a best man at his wedding. So we, we, I would say, are um, 
But we, we, we are able from that perspective to transcend any kind of rivalry. That sounds like kind of a lot of fancy words, but I think a lot's made of uh, the Stanford uh, uh, UCSF um, productive kind of uh, 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 sort of frisons maybe, but there, there in this case is a, a, a real, I think, uh, affection between the co-directors. And I, I think that uh, that extends uh, uh, to uh, the rest of the team members. So uh, we are perhaps a team of rivals at some level, but we're working close together on both of the major projects and the cores that support our, our groups. So um, I, I, would just, uh, I would just answer it that way. Well, that's great. I'm gonna- that's uh, great. Go as we add to this, um, as Song pointed out, we're doing this for almost 25 years. It's, it's a substantial part of our career. It's almost a quarter century that we have been working together. We continue to work together even after Song had moved to Stanford and then a year later I moved to, to UCSF. And we are uh, having actually accelerated some of the work that we're doing together. But as Song pointed out, um, we know each other very well, we're good friends, and I think we're moving this thing forward. So I'm going to get into, and I, I again, Penn and John, I see your questions. I'll, I'm going to come up on those in a second. But just let's talk about islet transplantation and now stem cell derived islets and what Stanford and UCSF, what the teams here are working on. So number one question to both of you is, are stem cell derived islets ready for prime time? Yeah, I probably should take this one. There, uh, so many of you on this call will know that there are a number of companies, and as a full disclosure, I have been collaborating, actually consulting for these companies, uh, including Sema, uh, who, who was started by our former mentor, Doug Melton, uh, as well as Viasite. Uh, these companies have moved forward quite significantly in some of them are already, why I said, in clinical trials using human stem cell derived pancreatic cells. Now, why I said does not generate full different to beta cells, but they're using pancreas progenitors. Happy to discuss this at, at some point. It's a term that essentially describes a cell that is not quite a beta cell yet. And SEMA is generating beta cells that, that seem to be functioning uh, exactly like the cells that we have in our body. So uh, the answer is yes almost certainly yes, with a little bit of, of a question mark still, because we still have to do the experiments of actually putting these cells into patients. And one of the issues that we are right now still dealing with is how to do this. Because as I alluded to in my introductory remarks, if you take beta cells and you put them into a patient who has a, a longstanding autoimmune disease, against the beta cells, they will be destroyed. So you have to protect the cells you put in, and we are still struggling with trying to understand how we do this. So Viocyte, for example, had a, what we call an encapsulation device. And when they put the cells into the encapsulation device, most of the cells did not survive well. So they actually punched holes in it, and they had just um, published their second trial, and, and the beta cells seem to be doing better there. So. Do we have cells that can go into patients? I think so. Do we have cells that are protected to survive? I think that is some of the work that needs to be done and that's exactly what our center is, is interested in exploring. That's great. And I'm gonna come to the other barrier because I know some of the work that's being done in this center of excellence is some of the most cutting edge in the world in terms of that how do we protect the cells? And I know, Song, you mentioned uh, Dr. Myers is on, and you have a team there that, uh, that are transferring some amazing work from the field of kidney transplantation. Do you want to talk about the other side of the equation, which is immunoprotection of cells? Sure. Um, so uh, the, there's a, a number of approaches to try to, uh, to protect cells that are introduced uh, into a patient that has uh, ongoing autoimmunity. Uh, depending on what kind of cells those are, they might be also need to be protected from uh, uh, more sort of uh, uh, an, uh, rejection of a non-self or allo, uh, allo uh, rejection. So there's two kinds of 
potential barriers, allo and auto uh, immunity. Um, one of the approaches I think that some people may know about uh, and are being explored by Dr. Hebrook and his uh, collaborators, as well as people like uh, Kyle Lowe at Stanford, are to modify the actual cells you put in so that they became sort of uh, in, um, invisible or uh, evade immune, uh, immune rejection, whether it's allo, auto or allo. Uh, a different approach, but related, is to reset, reboot the immune system. So like hitting control C uh, on your, uh, your uh, immune cells, there, uh, there's an approach that uh, has been taken and is working to achieve that in organ uh, replacement uh, here at Stanford, as well as at other centers, the Mass General and uh, no, uh, Northwestern. So multiple centers have a, uh, adopted an approach where uh, stem cells that give rise to the blood and all of the subsequent immune cells uh, from that are introduced that match the organ that you're trying to replace. In, this, uh, in, in the uh, last 20 or so years, uh, people here like Sam Strober, along with Judy Suzuro, who's part of our center, as well as um, uh, Everett Meyer, have approached uh, the problem of replacing organs and protecting them simultaneously by resetting the immune system. And so combine blood stem cell transplantation with the organ uh, that you're interested in uh, seems to be working and uh, it uh, is a surprise to some, uh, even highly sophisticated, knowledgeable people in, uh, in, in diabetes, uh, um, the, the realm, to, to hear that you can achieve this, say, for a solid organ like the kidney. You can replace the kidney in someone who needs a kidney, give them matched blood stem cells, and after a couple of years, they can go off all immunosuppression systemic drugs. So, and, and, the, and Dr. Myers, who's on the call, as well as Dr. Shizuru, who couldn't be here today, have been involved with those seminal trials. So what we are trying to do is uh, now uh, achieve that kind of a scenario with islet replacement. And that's one of the, one of the uh, things that my university and department have allowed us to go on with, in spite of the COVID pandemic, we are doing what they deem as essential experiments, uh, which are so damn exciting. We are actually trying to cure diabetes in our experimental animals. Some of them are derived from collaborations with Dr. Hebrock's uh, people, including Kishi Tong. And we were right in the middle of those initial sets of studies when this pandemic hit. So they're letting us do that, um, recognizing this is an important thing. Uh, and we're so we're very excited because this preclinical kind of uh, data is going to feed into the plan that we have, I think, for uh, then moving to human trials. So that's a different way that, uh, uh, among others, um, now uh, Dr. Meyer and Shizuru are pioneering here, and we're collaborating on those uh, um, that approach with um, the UCSF group. So. That's, that's an idea, rebooting the immune system um, in a way that's not only thorough, but um, increasingly safe, safer than in the past. So let me- Yeah, it's so uh, exciting. You see me smiling in the background here and Everett, I see you back there. Uh, it's good to see you virtually. Um, and thank you for all the work. So I'm just gonna restate for our volunteers and uh, uh, for folks who are uh, less uh, technical. When we look at, cell replacement, or you, you've heard JDRF say encapsulation a lot. Again, think of the two big buckets here. We want cells, for, enough for everybody. You know, islet transplantation and organ donations will never meet the supply need for everybody with diabetes. So the, what the work that there, that's happening here and what Dr. Hebrock just pointed out is stem cell derived islets are on the cusp, if not ready for prime time. So that would mean we have enough cells, in theory, uh, to cure everybody with type 1. The term encapsulation we're using um, less broadly now because there are other approaches to protect from rejection. 
And just again, I know not everybody understands allo versus auto. And what we're talking about is we, we have two problems here for type one people, rejection of a cell that's not yours and rejection of beta cells. And we need to fix both of those because the stem cells are coming from a stem cell line, not from your own body, at least in, in this version. So this idea of how do you protect those cells? One way is encapsulating them or protecting them with a physical barrier. But what we're talking about here is not having a physical barrier, potentially retraining the immune system so they are recognized as not foreign as is happening in these amazing studies with whole organ tr transplantation and kidney, which Dr. Meyer uh, 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 was, uh, is part of. Um, so it's just an incredible science. It talks about the, when we use the term cures, that there's not one potential solution. There are multiple potential ways to get at this. And this to me is just, it's just, it's just so awesome because it's just such cool science. All right, well, I'm gonna um, pivot for one second to, I see a question about COVID and maybe you all can talk about the impact of COVID on your research. And then the specific question is about, is there overlapping science that we may be able to take to help? Because as long as COVID's out there, we know there's additional risk for people with diabetes. Although I think uh, Jim unwinding some of the additional risk between type one and type two, uh, we're still working on, but we, we all know that it's a, a big problem. Um, do you, do you uh, folks want to comment on how it's impacting your labs now and the overlapping science and in, in immunology? Sure, happy to do this. So let me just, before I get there and, and, and get into COVID, let me just point out two more things about the immunology, just very briefly. Uh, Song was, was, was very uh, clear in, in, in indicating that we're working to something that would uh, protect the cells. Um, what we also can do now, the stem cells that we're using, the embryonic stem cells or iPS cells, are just absolutely amazing cells. What I mean by that is they can turn into every single cell that you have in your body. And so what we're doing now, and, and uh, Dr. Bluestone and people in his lab like Linda Vo, as well as Mark Anderson and Audrey Perrin and, and, and uh, my group, what we are generating are components of the immune system, T cells, T regulatory cells, T effector cells, as well as thymic epithelial cells. There's a lot of names, but essentially what they're doing is they are different parts of the immune system. And by being able to generate them and modify them using the gene editing technologies that, that others uh, have, have been developing, we can now essentially try to understand how they work together with beta cells and how they can go astray and killing those cells. So this information, which is also part of the center, I think is gonna be critical in instructing us how we're gonna modify the immune system. So going back to COVID, COVID has essentially pushed us back in terms of that we are not able to go in every single day into the lab and work. We are working, we are essentially looking at our data sets. As Song just said, we also have certain things that are going on in our, in our laboratories, which are long standing experiments, often with mouse models that go on for a long period of time. So when we, for example, transplant these stem cell derived beta cells that we generate and put them under the kidney capsule, and then we have done this in modulating the immune system, we're trying to understand how they survive, how they do, they often stay in weeks if not months. And so these experiments are still going on. So it's not a complete waste of time, but it is true that we were all thinking that we are essentially moving faster and faster as in large part to the support we're getting from the JDRF for the center of excellence. And some of these experiments unfortunately had to be stopped. So we are gearing up right now, actually, in, in discussions I have with the leadership at, at UCSF, and I'm pretty sure Song has the same at Stanford, how we can go back to work and then what are the critical experiments we can do right off the bat to essentially get back into the game. So COVID has unfortunately shown us that some of our infrastructure is not as stable as we hope, and I think this is true for everything in the country, but what I think the other thing it is showing us is that the having access to data and having scientific exploration 
is the way out of a crisis. And the one thing I hope you to, to understand is that we're learning actually something from the COVID response that also can be used for autoimmune diseases. And furthermore, that once COVID will go away, which it does, I think having a robust research infrastructure in place and having it supported throughout this crisis is going to allow us to go to a cure much, much faster. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you, Matthias. And I, I see uh, there's a, a point about some of the work that I know Jeff has spear, Dr. Bluestone has spearheaded with uh, the Parker Institute on checkpoint inhibitors and the intersection between Im immune regulation and, and some of the cancer uh, checkpoint inhibitors and, and the, the, the drive towards autoimmunity. And I think your point of the intersection of science uh, is, is uh, certainly there. And those learnings uh, we are taking advantage of to make uh, progress on multiple fronts. In fact, for the volunteers on the phone, I was on uh, a call today with uh, an or, uh, a foundation who's supporting us for a pan autoimmunity uh, initiative where we're working with uh, the multiple sclerosis and lupus organizations on shared mechanism and, and autoimmunity. Um, a couple folks uh, to the investigators have asked questions about, uh, Sung, you talked about being in preclinical and are UCSF and Stanford able to move into clinical trials and how would that look? Uh, and if they did and when you, I should say when, um, what, what would the age boundaries be and how would you tackle moving into clinical trials? Yes, um, I, uh, I'm going to um, answer that uh, myself and then I might prompt uh, someone who's running clinical trials, Dr. Meyer, to chime in uh, afterwards. Um, I think that uh, there has multiple parts to it. Uh, there's this early phase, you know, trying to cure diabetes in an animal model, in a mouse. That's what we're trying to do. And we're, I think, on the cusp of doing that in ways that haven't been done before uh, with uh, this combined stem cell and islet replacement. Um, in terms of uh, getting Two clinical trials, that's part of our plan, as I mentioned, and I see some questions about that. Dr. Shizuru and Dr. Uh, of Bluestone and Dr. Meyer are all involved with clinical trials now, and they are not stopping necessarily. The patients that have been treated are still being assessed, and the news there relates to the uh, innovations that have been coming up about either uh, dampening the autoimmune uh, attack, uh, earlier uh, and earlier in the course of the disease or using antibodies, there was a question about teplizumab, uh, to uh, more gently prepare uh, a person, a human, for a stem cell transplant to replace parts of their immune system. So those trials are going on already. And the good news is that uh, we're learning a lot. And in some cases, there seems to be progress or even uh, uh, reason for optimism about success. So those aren't necessarily all in diabetes or type 1, but I think that there is tremendous excitement about how this could be uh, transposed or translated to islet replacement with blood stem cells. Uh, that's the idea. And this is largely occurring, I think, uh, in, um, in adults but with a telling exception in Dr. Shizuru's research that's funded by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine and other entities, she is targeting newborn kids with a so-called severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, the boy in the bubble disease. And the idea there is to see if antibody treatments are safe as well as effective in getting ready the blood stem cell compartment in the bone marrow for uh, rebooting. And those are trials that are, uh, are ongoing, current. And the good news is that I think that without knowing yet the uh, actual outcomes, uh, the, it looks very promising in terms of safety as well as, uh, as efficacy, it, it, the, the potency. So I would say that uh, the, the, there is a kind of uh, organize, organized uh, 
approach through the center and the center members to not only address diabetes and these issues, but also across a span of, um, of, uh, uh, of patient uh, uh, age ranges. I think that the initial clinical trials we hope to do would be in adults. It would be in people who might not even initially be uh, subject to the two kinds of uh, problems, the uh, allo rejection, non-self, as well as auto. We might think initially about trials with people who just uh, don't have islets and need them uh, because they have uh, bad diabetes. And so we would try to replace their islets, uh, but they would not then be subject to auto uh, immune attack based mechanism. So th that's a, a step forward. That's part of the plan, we think. And because UCSF and Stanford have now uh, um, clinical islet transplant uh, efforts, uh, UCSF's is more established, ours is just a borning, uh, we can collaborate on that initial step. And then we can move out into diabetics, uh, as well as perhaps early and earlier stages of diabetes. So I hope that was not too long-winded. No, I think that's great. And I'll just add from a JDR perspective, and I see Joe asked a question about how do we build these projects and what's the role of the institutions and investigators and JDRF and coming to the question of, of clinical trials, because I think it, it highlights a bit of how we coordinate things, is, for example, we have a health policy team that's been working with FDA and um, institutions like Stanford and UCSF and our investigators, but really the entire field on uh, setting uh, the pathway through FDA to doing human work uh, in novel areas of research like this. And this goes way back, again, I referenced uh, the work I did with Drs. Buckingham and Wilson and the team at Stanford on artificial pancreas. It seems like a, a dream now, but 10 years ago, uh, people uh, bristled at the thought of automating insulin delivery uh, with sensors that were erroneous. And um, that took a lot of hard work uh, with FDA on carving out what is the pathway? How do you move from adults to kids? How do you move? We now do studies in babies uh, with closed loop systems and pregnant uh, women. And similarly, the pathway here is not only a pathway amongst the investigators and expert clinical trialists and physicians, but also with regulators who are balancing risk benefit ratios and, and, and uh, determining a pathway. Uh, the one other thing that I'll say, uh, and then we'll take a couple more questions is, um, when we work on these projects, and this gets to Joe's question, um, we're really trying to work with the investigators and the team at JDRF to carve out the unique value of uh, the research we're funding. Of course, we don't have enough dollars to fund everything we would like, so the, the, I think what the JDRF scientists can bring to the table is some contextualization of the broad landscape. And uh, this center, obviously doing this work is part of our beta cell replacement consortium. We bring together the scientists every twi uh, twice every year. There's uh, companies, there's regulators, there are other funders like Helmsley and NIH. And um, that helps shape uh, these proposals. So um, Karen, and I'll, I'm gonna send a shout out to the amazing Karen Jordan who asked the, the next question and has really been uh, a volunteer lead to get this off the ground. Uh, talks about the um, incredible collaboration between these, the, the two powerhouse institutions here and how that's driven uh, things even faster and maybe Sung and Matthias, you can talk about how partnership accelerates progress. Yeah, I, I can take a first step at this. Um, the, so my lab has spent more than a decade trying to coax cells into becoming mature beta cells and, and we succeeded in doing so and we published this last year. 
And this has been just a, a tremendous amount of work from a, an unbelievable crew in, in my laboratory. And it's not just my laboratory, other laboratories have done this as well, but it's, it's, it's just a handful around the world who has been able to do this. And so uh, Song has, for example, a few genes um, that, that have a specific uh, function in, in beta cells and we knew this in mouse uh, and, and it appeared to be slightly different in humans. And so we have been training some of his people in, in the laboratory to essentially take this technology that we have developed to then also establish it uh, at, at Stanford, as well as helping him with, um, you know, getting some of the, the, the early tools ready to do so he can do this, this kind of in, in investigation. And the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, this technology is, is nothing you can get off the shelf. You can't just go somewhere in any kind of university and say, can I get me, can I get me a stem cell drive beta cell? This is something that is, is really difficult to generate. And the same is true for a stem cell generated T cell that Jeff Lucen is generating and some of the work that Kyle Lowe is doing. And so by going back and forth between our institutions, UCSF and Stanford, we take advantage of the slightly distinct in part overlapping activities that we have going on as well as the expertise. And it just accelerates the work that we're doing. So that is, I think, is an example of how we, we think uh, to move this forward. Because if someone would have to wait, or I would have to wait until these things are published, it's usually a year or, so or longer until you actually have that kind of information in hand. Yeah, I mean, I would say you know, that, that uh... Matthias covered uh, it. I mean, we're 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 exchanging expertise between people, and we're exchanging reagents, including living reagents like mice. We've gotten mice from UCSF. Our group has sent them to UCSF. Uh, the people uh, are trying uh, what they think are the most uh, exciting and reasonable experiments that are supported by. Uh, prior results. So Julie Snedden at, at UCSF is working with Kyle Lowe, who's on the call here, uh, to see uh, how to work around the idea that islets are not simply making hormones, but they're vascular organs. They need support cells. So they're working together on elements of move, mixing cells together. The idea that Matthias just mentioned involves mixing cells together that normally wouldn't be mixed together, uh, and, uh, and so on. I'd say at a clinical level, there's uh, already very clear interactions led by, among others, Stefan Busk and uh, Everett Meyer and others here, and the UCSF transplant uh, um, program to uh, come together in terms of islet transplantations. And so they've been very helpful in terms of building a program here at Stanford that we hope to, uh, we hoped actually to do our first transplant this spring, but uh, um, life intervened. So those are two, uh, th those are also, ex that's an example of clinical interactions. Um, there was a question about how this is all coordinated. Of course, JDRF is in the cockpit. They oversee us uh, and require uh, uh, preliminary um, sort of regular reports on our progress but we also interact uh, directly. This is, after all, this is California. It's, it's sort of un informal. I'll just pick up the phone or I'll go see people uh, uh, and, um, and, and see how they're, how the, what's going on. So Dr. Stedden before this, uh, before March 15 came down twice and we met together and that sort of thing. So there's all sorts of ways of coordinating, but I think both formal and informal uh, and it's um, it's very exciting. This is that's the kind of thing that Dr. Habrock and I are uh, are good at. As let me let me say one let me say one more thing because I think we're running out of time. But but Aaron, if I can just say something. Song said it. We we use the information that we have gathered. So our experiments, of course, based on fact. But we're also pushing the envelope. We are doing experiments that other people would not be doing in support, of course, through the, the work that, that the JRAF is, is doing in, in helping us here. We are truly really trying to push this thing forward 
in, in, in going into something in the Silicon Valley approach to break things fast, to find out if things are working or not. And if not, then moving quickly to the next good ideas. We don't, we don't have a problem of ideas. We just have to move these things quickly forward. And therefore, by building all these tools, all these reagents and having the collaborations, I think we can, we can do this. That's exciting. I know we're coming up on the top of the hour. I'm going to uh, say some uh, closing remarks. Uh, we can stay on if uh, folks have last minute questions, but I want to thank uh, the investigators, Dr. Hebrock and Dr. Kim. You guys are amazing. It's always, uh, I'm smiling because I enjoy these conversations so much. Um, and to all of the investigators, I've been scrolling through and seeing the teams from UCSF and Stanford who've taken time uh, out of today, but who dedicate uh, countless hours, uh, often seven days a week, to driving uh, the mission of carrying T1D forward. Um, this center uh, is an $8 million project. We've raised about $4 million. I know there are a number of our volunteers who have led the way on the phone, and I thank you. I've seen a number of uh, our supporters who support the Michigan and Harvard Center. Uh, thank you. And uh, for folks who are on the phone and interested in leaning in, in a time uh, where uh, we are seeing fundraising dropping, if you have that ability, uh, certainly reach out to me. I think uh, there's no time like right now to, to if you have the, the, the means to lean in and help because the science is amazing right now, as you've heard over the last hour. And uh, we have an opportunity to, to uh, change diabetes uh, fundamentally uh, and, and maybe even start to walk away. Um, so if you have other questions, you can uh, shoot them to me or Elizabeth or Nicole at the Bay Area chapter um, or uh, the teams. Um, I'm looking at Jim. Uh, uh, we will follow up with you, Jim, uh, and, and give you more information. On, on the COVID and immunology overlaps. But Matthias Sung, thank you. Stanford and UCSF teams, thank you. Uh, and Elizabeth, I'll pass the baton back to you. Great. Thank you again, uh, Aaron. Thank you, Matthias and Sung and the teams. We are just so grateful for your ongoing efforts. If those of you on the call are interested in hearing any more about the work being done at this center, the Bay Area Diabetes Summit is hosting a virtual panel discussion this coming Sunday, April 26th. That will be from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern or 11 to noon Pacific. Uh, Dr. Hebrock will be on that panel. So will uh, Dr. Bluestone and Dr. Meyer from Stanford. So thank you again to Fiduciary Trust and special thanks to each one of you for joining us. Have a great weekend and please do stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks team. Thanks for taking the time. All right, bye-bye guys. Just looking if there are any further questions here. I don't know if Jim stayed on, but if he did, Jim, we can uh, try to get your question. Jim, did you stay on? I'm looking to say. Doesn't, I don't see his name. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks team and thanks to all the folks on the phone. Matthias, uh, a song that was that was fun. Uh, really good discussion. Yeah, thank thanks you. I'm, I'm just writing something. Jeff is actually doing something with COVID. So um, Great. I'm responding to Jim Jacobson. Okay. I think I think if you he, if he's in earshot or even if he's not, the, the way I took his question is, uh, first of all, immunology is so damn interesting. Everyone is sort of becoming an immunologist, whether they want to or not, by reading the New York Times or whatever. Uh, the idea, though, that maybe screening is an important thing to do uh, is, I think, related to JDRF and Helmsley and others sort of support of 
screening for early onset uh, disease dates that you can then intervene in or know something about. So people, everyone is learning about the, that natural history of a disease is so important, right? Prevalent yeah. and all that, who, who gets it and who doesn't and why, the severity and all that. So I think that from that point of view, um, uh, support for infectious agents, and, and who knows, maybe that's relevant. Uh, I don't think his question was about can COVID cause diabetes, but um, uh, you know, I think the, the whole notion that we are becoming uh, as a world more interested in uh, so slowly uh, learning about how complicated immunology is, is, um, is going to impact uh, the immune-based sort of uh, studies that are really kind of outside in some ways this center's uh, main focus, but um, uh, um, uh, that, that, that's how I would have answered him, so. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think it's, it's been also challenging for us in that the data out of China, some of the data out of Italy, and now I'm not sure if it was Lancet or New England Journal, did a meta-analysis of uh, COVID morbidity and mortality and showing diabetes is one of the um, really bad predictors of bad outcomes. But if you read the papers, um, you can't tease out, you know, they, they're, the caveats are uh, uh, what form of diabetes, what glycemic control, but for our community, it's scary. And I, uh, Sanjoy and the team, are working with a number of the countries who can track this data much more carefully via registries, I expect the type one diabetes data will be uh, much less, you know, for, for, for the bulk of folks in terms of the, the severity of outcomes you're seeing in a, in a older type two population, but it is terrifying our community. And that's, that's part of an issue. There's an interesting link. I mean, the mechanisms are really under not understood uh, as far as I can tell from those papers. I talked to my wife who's on the on the front line, so to speak, uh, at the VA hospital here. There's increasingly uh, some indication that uh, that um, intravascular coagulation, uh, in particular uh, that affect the lung may, uh, underlie uh, a lot of the problems, and so as you, as we know, um, vasculopathy or uh, endothelial sort of uh, issues, especially in more chronic forms of diabetes, is it, it is end organ damage. So uh, the link between intravascular coagulation and diabetes could be, uh, in part, um, uh, reflecting uh, endothelial biology. And that's the way I've been trying to piece together some of this lately. Um, and it's quite dramatic what people are finding. Um, one of the things I read was uh, the observations that pulmonary compliance, when normally you have uh, a lung full of uh, infectious agent and, and fluids, it, the, the lungs don't compress or, or, or expand appropriately, but uh, people are making observations that the compliance is actually not affected. And so what the hell is going on in these fatal pneumonias or lung uh, damage? Uh, the idea that the vascular component might be clogged is uh, consistent with the idea that there's air hunger, there's hypoxia, because there's no uh, basically flow of oxygen to the red cells. So mm. I think to me that uh, th those things may be uh, um, uh, a way to not only uh, say, look, it's important for um, type two, but also any type of diabetes that has perhaps endothelial damage, and that would be type one as well. So we'll see. A lot of this is now just unreproduced data sets that are coming out from diff different places. We have to wait and see. I like Matthias and your point though, that science is really a way to, to understand. Yeah. The, it's the way we get there. Yeah. Nicole, uh, any final parting thoughts? Oh, you're muted, you're muted. You'd think I'd have that done by now. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank you for the good work you're doing and for staying focused um, and keep keep driving progress. And we're working hard to make sure we're finding the funding to support the work. So thank you.
So I, I think I said this in between. I, I just want to say this one more time, and I, I know some feels the same way. Thank you guys, right? I mean, you you are helping us to to allow us to do this work. And there's nothing more frustrating than for us to have an, an idea and something that we know is is likely going to make a difference of not being able to actually do the work. So you guys have been invaluable in this, and you have been a partner in this, and. Um, I certainly, and, and I'm no song as well, we are committed to helping you as much as possible in, in helping us and therefore helping our, our mm -hmm. constituents and our patients. So thank you very much. Uh, 